Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, as Chris said, we will be having kind of a joint ground rounds today, um, and we'll be discussing cardiogenic shock update. I have no disclosures. And today, in my 15 minutes or so, I will discuss etiology of cardiogenic shock, new definitions, stages, helpful formulas, shock team predictors of outcome, very briefly, ECMO versus Impella, and we'll finish the whole um, session with a case. The main causes of cardiogenic shock in adults are related to left ventricular failure, either from acute myocardial infarction or acute on chronic heart failure. Other causes include uh, mechanical complication of myocardial infarction, isolated RV shock, mainly from pulmonary embolism, and also rarer causes such as fulminant myocarditis, peripartum cardiomyopathy, chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy, or in post-transplant patients' primary graft failure. For years, we've been using definitions of cardiogenic shock based on clin clinical and laboratory findings and hemodynamics. Main clinical and laboratory findings include altered mentation, shortness of breath, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting from gut ischemia, cool periphery or pulmonary congestion on clinical examination, renal failure, lactic acidosis. Hemodynamics include persistent hypotension, defined as systolic blood pressure of less than 80 to 90 for about um, 30 minutes, or MAP less than 60. However, we need to remember that patients who are uh, normally um, hypertensive can be in shock with higher blood pressures. And low cardiac index in a setting of normal or elevated filling pressures without support less than two and with moderate maximal support of um, vasoactive medications plus minus balloon pump of less than 2.2. There's been the sense in the community, however, that cardiogenic shock is not all created equal, and it's rather an umbrella term for different clinical entities. This is a study that I try to uh, quote a lot. I think it's pretty um, a neat study that was published several years ago, where Dr. Samuels and others looked at um, stages of cardiogenic shock and mortality, depending on the number of vasoactive medications that patients needed for support. So if you had no requirement for any vasoactive medications, your mortality was low, less than 5%. When you needed full hemodynamic support with three, doses of, uh, three high doses of vasoactive medications, mortality was very high of over 80%. And 20 years later from that publication, Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions published clinical expert consensus statement on the new classification of cardiogenic shock. What they did, they divided cardiogenic shock into five stages from A to E. A, at risk, so patients who are not in shock yet, but um, there is a potential. So patients who um, present, for example, with acute myocardial infarction or acute on chronic heart failure. Stage B, patients who have uh, clinical evidence of hypotension without uh, hypoperfusion, so beginning shock, classic shock, a patient who does have signs of hypoperfusion and hypotension, requires vasoactive medications or mechanical support, de-deteriorating patients who, despite those measurements, measures um, still um, get, are getting worse and maybe will require ECMO, and then extremist patients who are undergoing um, eCPR or CPR or are, uh, we're not able to maintain their hemodynamics with available um, devices and medications. <clears throat> this classification was validated in a retrospective analysis of the Mayo Clinic CICU patients, over 10,000 patients. Majority of them uh, had ACS or heart failure. And an adjusted hospital mortality was 3% if someone was in stage A, and 67% when patients was in stage E. So each higher sky shock stage was associated with increased hospital mortality when compared with stage A. Similarly, it was also validated in patients after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And as you see here, oh, almost 400 page, uh, patients mean um, age uh, 64 years, predominantly males. And what they noticed was that there was a stepwise significant increase in 30-day mortality 
with increasing shock rate after cardiac arrest with 30%, around 30% percent stage A and 83% percent, percent stage E. There was also an increased need for um, renal replacement therapy and higher prevalence of multi-organ failure. Now I would like to switch gear a little bit to old formulas with uh, new applications, especially two formulas that kind of gain their uh, momentum and are pretty easy to calculate right there in the cath lab or in the ICU. The first one is cardiac power output. You calculate it by multiplying mean arterial pressure times cardiac output over 451 with a normal range of um, above 0.6. And as you can see uh, on this graph, and this is a graph from the original shock trial, uh, cardiac power output was, the hemo was a hemodynamic variable that was most strongly associated with in-hospital mortality. Similarly, another um, measurement, so-called PAPI, pulmonary artery pulsatility index, as you see, you only need uh, hemodynamics to calculate it with a normal value above 1.85, and this uh, measurement was actually validated in patients um, after, right uh, after acute inferior myocardial infarction to diagnose RV failure in patients uh, to predict um, right ventricular failure after left ventricular assist device implantation, and also recently in patients with advanced heart failure. So the question is, how do we best treat these patients, and how do we make sure that we introduce therapies that will actually be helpful and improve uh, survival. During last ELSO meeting, Dr. Wald from University of Pennsylvania presented um, their um, idea of a shock team and what the goals are and how they work it out. So basically they created the shock team a couple of years ago that was um, that meant to rapidly identify patients who would benefit from temporary mechanical support, but at the same time were candidates for durable mechanical support. They called it um, go or no go, and they felt that this approach improved survival. Um, comparing to uh, what we do here at Minneapolis Heart Institute, it's a little bit different because they, they're a huge referral center. So they actually tell the referring um, centers that the patient is not a candidate for escalation of care and therefore transfer doesn't happen. Our philosophy here has been more, we're gonna take anyone and then here, we're gonna evaluate patients and decide what best therapies patients would be served with and uh, whether there are candidates for advanced therapies. Um, this shock team approach was also uh, described by Dr. Basir and colleagues uh, based on the National Cryogenic Shock Registry. They looked at 35 sites that agreed to treat patients with acute myocardial infarction using a standard protocol that emphasized invasive hemodynamics and rapid initiation of mechanical circulatory support. What was interesting and what we actually have been noticing here at Minneapolis Heart Institute was that average door to support time was shorter than average door to balloon time. And this is really what our interventional cardiologists have been practicing for several years now, that when the patient comes in profound shock, we need to restore circulation with ECMO followed by uh, percutaneous intervention. What's interesting is that 74% of these patients had mechanical circulatory support implanted prior to uh, PCI. Survival to discharge was really high, 72%. When you look at ELSA registry, survival to discharge in patients who need ECMO, um, and these patients were actually quite sick. Uh, some of them came in a cardiac arrest um, so per ELSO, it's about 60-58% uh, survival, uh, whereas this was 72%. And predictors of mortality, which is not surprising, included uh, creatinine over 2, lactate over 4, cardiac power output, and they did calculate it on every patient less than 0.6, which was validated prior, and then older age. Um, I always laugh that I wouldn't be a cardiologist if I didn't talk about a balloon pump. And uh, we all know that um, shock to trial was an overall negative study. However, what I think came out, uh, very, which is uh, very valuable um, out of um, shock uh, to trials, are uh, predictors of 30-day mortality. And this, um, these predictors were actually validated in external cohort. So they identified uh, the following parameters, age over 73, prior stroke, glucose more than 191, creatinine more than 
TIMI less than three after PCI and lactate about five. And they uh, divided these patients depending on the overall score um, into three groups. So if score was uh, zero to two, mortality was 24%. It was about five or 70, uh, 77%. And as that you can see in our patients, for example, it's really easy to have a lactate about five an age above 73. And that right there gives you a mortality of 25%. And I think um, I actually um, don't maybe do it like officially, but I do it a little bit in my head because sometimes if we're kind of not sure whether we should proceed with ECMO implantation, if the patient is not doing that bad, we kind of escalating pressors. I think this can help us make the decision what type of mechanical support and how much to uh, escalate the, pre uh, the um, therapy, uh, knowing that the overall mortality at 30 days may, may be much higher than we just think it is. And even though today, uh, surprisingly, I won't be talking about VA ECMO, uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that there is actually a very neat um, calculator. It's called the SAFE score that predicts survival after VA ECMO. And um, again, we rarely use it in the cath lab because um, uh, there's just no time, but uh, I actually have it on my iPhone and anybody can upload it. I think it's also a very good tool uh, for benchmarking and actually going back uh, to the cases that didn't do well and then calculate it um, and then maybe pause and kind of understand why uh, the survival wasn't uh, good and maybe we should change something in terms of like on the programmatic level. And then the last question, ECMO versus Impella. Um, uh, Dr. Chavez will talk about it in more details. But I uh, just want to say that I often get this, um, get asked this question, which one is better? Which one should we do? Why don't you do Impella? I would say they're both valuable um, means of uh, temporary mechanical support. I think it depends on the center. It depends on the patient population. Definitely if you need biventricular support or if patients come in profound shock uh, in ARDS from uh, pulmonary congestion or aspiration, um, I don't see uh, impel a role in those patients, and I would say majority of our patients look like that. I also will say in this particular center, we haven't been very successful in maintaining patients on impella support chronically without significant hemolysis, and I'm talking about impella CP now. We only use a couple of five O's. Um, but I would say uh, impella, especially in this center, has been extremely useful uh, in using together with um, ECMO, so-called ECPELA, for leverage and loading that Ivan will discuss. There was a recent study, however, that looked at mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock from myocardial, acute myocardial infarction, looked at Impella 5.0, and this is an Impella that is played surgically uh, versus ECMO. It was a retrospective study. They looked at 30-day mortality and then complications. 128 patients were included. Um, Impella uh, had a double number of patients comparing to VECMO and 30-day uh, mortality was uh, the same, uh, but uh, there was less device-related complications with Impella um, than uh, VA ECMO, which again is not surprising. The cannula is smaller, uh, and I suspect um, vascular complications were uh, much lower. So I'm going to pause here, and then I'll finish off with, um, with a case. Thank you. Microphone, real quick. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending in person and online. I'm just going to switch our talks here. Uh, thanks, Kasha, for that uh, awesome review of shock. Uh, I've been asked to talk about VA ECMO from a um, cath lab perspective. And I actually gave this talk titled VA ECMO, the big gun, or is it? Uh, of course, I chose Dirty Harry as my title slide representative. Uh, but I thought I'd get bolder this year and uh, 
you know, grab an even bigger gun as Arnold Schwarzenegger as a Terminator. You can see how interventionists think. However, over the weekend, Sir Sean Connery passed away at the age of 90. Uh, and I thought uh, that I would tip my hat to him. This is a Sean Connery in The Untouchables for which he won a Best Supporting Actor. I have no disclosures. So what's the problem? The problem is that cardiogenic shock continues to be associated with poor survival. Now the original shock trial was published in 1999. I had just graduated from my fellowship uh, when this came out at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. So I'm gonna age myself a little bit. But the reason I'm doing that is since that time, despite all the advances in ICU care and mechanical support devices, there has been little improvement in the mortality of shock over the last 20 years. So why is that? Well, the way I think of it is that cardiogenic shock is a gunfight and the battlefield is very complex as you can see in this slide. I'm gonna speak more from acute MI perspective where you have acute systolic and diastolic heart failure and all the detrimental effects which include left ventricular overload, pulmonary congestion which produces hypoxemia, this contributes further to your ischemic left ventricle. And then on the mechanical side, you have a decrease in cardiac output, leading to hypotension and decreased coronary perfusion, even more ischemia. Then the systemic hypoperfusion and the vasocompensatory response, vasoconstrictor response overloads this ventricle. You get this vicious cycle of progressive myocardial dysfunction. Uh, and if not intervened upon or managed correctly, will culminate in death. So I think we're all familiar with how complex this can be. Kasha introduced the sky definitions, which uh, are very important. And I'm gonna give you an example of two randomized trials and how different they can be. These are both randomized trials for shock. The IMPRESS trial uh, was a study of an intraoretic balloon pump versus Impella CP. And the shock two trial, which Kasha talked about is a strategy of a balloon pump versus um, aggressive medical therapy after emergent revascularization and acute MI and shock. And at first glance, both of these trials had fairly classic definitions for shock, but that's where the uh, uh, similarities end. These trials could not be any more different. In the IMPRESS trial, they were very sick. All the patients were intubated. 90% had cardiac arrest, long time to ROSC. The majority needed therapeutic hyperthermia, lactates were very high, and they were very acidotic. In the SHOCK-2 trial, not so sick. They had some pulmonary congestion, elevated lactate was modest, some signs of hypoperfusion, of course, but much less sick than in press trial. So definitions are important, and the SKY definition of SHOCK uh, was a great advancement in this field. Essentially, it was a multidisciplinary uh, collaboration from interventional cardiologists, advanced heart failure surgeons, among others, who uh, made this very nice uh, uh, definition of shock. And their goal was really to make it simple so that anyone can diagnose shock from the in the field EMS uh, at the ICU bedside in the cath lab. And importantly, as Kasha pointed out about uh, cardiac arrest, there was a modifier in this, which is modifier A for cardiac arrest. And that's important because as Kasha showed at any stage of shock, it doesn't matter if you had cardiac arrest, you had a worse um, uh, survival. In our group, Dr. Santiago Garcia, Tim Henry, our fellow last year, Dr. Omer, uh, reviewed our level one database and published this in Jack Intervention earlier this year regarding cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest. And this validates what, uh, what we're saying is that if you presented with cardiogenic shock, shock and had a cardiac arrest, your mortality was double than if you did not have a cardiac arrest in the setting of shock. So what mechanical support devices do we use in the cath lab? This is not a new thing. In fact, we've been using ECMO, of course, for the last 10 years in, VA, in uh, refractory shock, but VA ECMO has been a lot around for a long time, for decades. It's been primarily used in the neonate and pediatric population. In the 70s, the intraoretic balloon pump was developed as well as PA catheters. And since then, there have been various support devices, including Tandem Heart and uh, Impella. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about intraoretic balloon pump. Very simple. The nice thing about this, it's easy to use. You can get it in in five minutes. It's a small bore cannula. It has a low complication profile. As you know, it it's uh, placed in the descending aorta past the subclavian uh, artery. 
and inflates time to the EKG in a diastole to augment diastolic pressure and thereby improving um, coronary perfusion pressure. Then it deflates in systole and produces an unloading effect. Well, you all know that the shock two trial was negative. It didn't matter whether you had a balloon pump or intensive medical therapy if you presented with acute MI and shock, the mortality still stuck at 50%. Well, maybe uh, as uh, we've alluded to that intra balloon pump is just not a very big gun. You need bigger guns because the battlefield is very complex. So let's talk about these two percutaneous LVAD devices, the tandem heart and the impella. The tandem heart uh, is a percutaneous LVAD that works by unloading the left ventricle and providing flow. Uh, and it does unloads the left ventricle indirectly by, uh, by um, uh, unloading the left atrium. And it's done by a tw 21 French transeptal cannula that is then connected to an external pump and then returns to the arterial system via usually a 19 French uh, cannula. So the unloading produces very beneficial effects, reduced LV preload, workload, filling pressures, wall stress, and myocardial oxygen demand. And you can get flows around four liters to maintain your end organ perfusion and your coronary perfusion, importantly. The impella device is uh, easy to use because it can be done under fluoroscopic guidance compared to the tandem heart. It's simply a, uh, like a pigtail catheter. It has an inlet area that directly drains the left ventricle. Uh, and then this impeller type rotor con produces continuous flow and is ejected above the aortic valve in a continuous fashion. And this produces very beneficial hemodynamic effects. You have a decrease in your left ventricular end diastolic pressure and volume. This leads to reduced wall tension, reduced microvascular resistance, and thereby improvement in your coronary perfusion and myocardial oxygen supply. The unloading produces a decrease in your mechanical work of your native heart, thus your demand is reduced. Flow uh, produced by these <coughs> catheters can vary anywhere from two and a half liters of an impella to five, three to four liters of an impella CP, and uh, five uh, liters with a large impella 5.0. And the continuous flow, of course, improves your cardiac power output and your end organ perfusion, and the maintenance of mutual pressure imp uh, improves your um, coronary perfusion and uh, increases your myocardial oxygen supply. So compared to the tandem heart, uh, we almost never use a tandem heart because it, it requires a lot of procedure time, maybe 30 minutes to 45 minutes. You need transeptal expertise. You need imaging like transeptual echo. It just is impractical when your patients are transitioning in, from, in front of you into a refractory shock. So these two percutaneous LVADs uh, do attack this complex gun battle at various levels, improving flows, unloading the left ventricle, uh, improving coronary perfusion pressure, uh, and uh, systemic uh, end organ perfusion. And there is data that they are better than a balloon pump, at least hemodynamically. And this meta-analysis, uh, these device Devices improve your cardiac index compared to balloon pump, improve mean arterial pressure, and unload as reflected by a reduction of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But rather disappointedly, at least in this and other analysis, it doesn't really have an impact on 30-day mortality. Uh, the only randomized trial of Impella versus the balloon pump is uh, the IMPRESS trial that we introduced earlier. And in these patients, uh, uh, Impella had no uh, improve, uh, no effect on mortality, despite its uh, hemodynamic uh, superiority, at least theoretically. There was no difference. We're still stuck at a mortality at six months in this trial at 50%. Well, maybe the problem is, as Sean Connery famously said in The Untouchables, that we're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Because it may not matter how good we are at uh, addressing these parts of the cardiogenic shock cycle, a lot of these patients become very sick, like in the IMPRESS trial particularly, they develop a systemic inflammatory response due to uh, inflammatory cytokines, interleukins, uh, that produce this vasodilatory type of shock that's very similar to sepsis. And once you're down this road, it's gonna be hard to reverse the mortality at all. They develop this multi-organ system dysfunction syndrome and you're simply gonna need a bigger gun. And VA ECMO, is that gun, uh, at least theoretically, because it can give you upwards of five or greater amount of flow. In addition, it can give you biventricular support and oxygenation. If you compare it to certainly the balloon pump and the smaller transvalvular devices, it produces much more flow and may be the answer to improving these outcomes. 
In addition, VA ECMO is easy to put in. This is a typical circuit. Uh, it takes probably just 10 minutes to get this in. It involves placing a 25 French multi-stage drainage cannula into the right atrium uh, at the level of the superior vena cava. And then this blood, this right atrium is drained via a pump. It goes through an oxygen and heat exchanger and returns the arterial system in a retrograde fashion, usually through a 15, 17, or 19 French cannula. And it can give you pretty good flow. It's probably going to be the best device to use in refractory stage D and E shock. There are no randomized trials for VA ECMO comparing to other uh, interventions. There are certainly um, a registry and other um, observational studies like this study from a group in Taiwan that looked at their experience in profound shock as defined as very hypotensive, as you see in the upper left, on an intra balloon pump on high dose pressors. They looked at their era before they introduced ECMO into their cath lab and ICU and afterwards. Their survival before they had ECMO was less than 40%, but once they integrated ECMO into their uh, cath lab and ICUs, they improved that outcome to 60%. VA ECMO can address the most profound type of shock, <laughs> stage E shock. This is a patient who presented at an outside uh, ER with the large uh, anterior lateral ST segment elevation in mind, including, as you note, elevation in AVR, which suggests a left main culprit. Quickly, he transitioned to ventricular fibrillation and could not be defibrillated. He was placed on Lucas, so that's your modifier A in the sky definitions. He was placed on Lucas and transferred to our facility. And by the time he got to us, he had had 100 minutes of Lucas time. Uh, he was very acidotic, pH 6.9. His lactate was over 10. We placed him on ECMO, and he was able to be defibrillated after a few minutes on ECMO. And then we were able to do this angiogram to define the obvious culprit in the distal left main proximal LED. So you can see the LED slowing very slow, flowing very slowly there in the setting of multivessel disease. He, then he underwent successful revascularization by setting the left main uh, LED and left circumflex. And he actually, I think, had about a four or five day ECMO run was neurologically intact and left the hospital in about three weeks with an ejection fraction around 35%. Well, if you're going to use a big gun, you have to be careful. As Dick Cheney's hunting buddy found out when they went quail hunting in Texas, <laughs> if you shoot that gun, you might hurt somebody, including your patient. So it's very important if you're gonna use this device to manage those complications. In the cath lab, the most important one to realize or to recognize is that VA ECMO can is associated with significant and almost immediate uh, LV mechanical overload. And this is because the retrograde cannula is providing retrograde flow and pressurizing your aorta. So it's gonna overload your left ventricle almost immediately. And this has obvious deleterious effects such as increasing myocardial ischemia at the worst possible time, increase your myocardial oxygen demand, impaired LV recovery. It can be associated with long-term adverse myocardial remodeling, irreversible heart failure. And of course, the pressure is transmitted through the circuit, through the LA, the left atrium, pulmonary venous system. You can have increased, uh, or sorry, impaired gas exchange, which then will further worsen your ischemia. Looking at it physiologically with pressure volume loops, which I am no expert, but just briefly, in early shock in the QMI, you have a decrease in your LV contractility, as evidenced by this uh, downward movement of your Emax curve. Your pressure volume relationship moves to the right, reducing your stroke volume as your left ventricular volume and pressure increase. Later start stages of refractory shock, things get really bad. You have a market reduction in your contractility, a market shift in your pressure volume loop to the right, market reduction in your stroke volume. Then at the worst possible time, you add retrograde flow, which worsens the situation completely. And if you're not careful, of course, here comes your pulmonary edema, which can be very refractory. Uh, and if you don't recognize this early, you can really reduce your stroke volume to the point where you no longer have an ejecting heart. The aortic valve is not opening, the heart's fairly contracting, and then only trouble can happen from there, like uh, developing complications of left ventricle thrombosis or stone heart, which is uh, not salvageable. So make sure you have a strategy when you use a big gun uh, and at the, immediately you can manage this at the bedside by decreasing your ECMO flow adding uh, inotropes to like a hybrid approach so you don't risk this non-ejecting heart. 
You can vasodilate patients on ECMO. You can add balloon pumps. But if you really are getting a threatened, non-ejecting heart, you're going to have to vent that ventricle with either natural septostomy, a surgical vent, or preferably and easier, adding an impella to the system, which is termed ECPELA. Yale's going to talk about uh, managing these complications, and uh, there's plenty to worry about. Uh, you can have major bleeding, uh, lower extremity ischemia, compartment syndrome, amputation. All these things are going to worsen your survival when our goal is to improve your survival. So you have to have a strategy not only to recognize this early, but to manage it. When you put ECMO in the background of the other devices we talked about, it is the biggest gun. It's got the best flow. It's got biventricular support but it's got the worst complication profile. So complication management when using a big gun, it's very important. So yes, never bring a knife to a gunfight, he's right. But what is the gunfight? What is the definition? Recognize which type of shock this is. These are, these are two different types of shock altogether. You don't need a ECMO in shock in potentially in, in lesser degrees of shock. Uh, and to be fair to the Impella CP, this was not a trial of Impella CP versus balloon pump in cardiogenic shock. This was a trial of intraoretic balloon pump and uh, Impella CP in cardiac arrest. So it's no surprise that the mortality is no different. They just had the wrong gun. I think Kasha alluded to this initiative nationwide. Uh, this is uh, and this started with the work of Bill O'Neill in the cath lab and others in uh, uh, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. They developed a, a national cardiogenic shock initiative, modeling cardiogenic shock to STEMI management, door to balloon time, door to support time. And using the sky definition, they felt it was important to integrate this into a system of care and algorithms uh, and to recognize shock early, even in the field with these new sky definitions, and then activate the cath lab, do your angiogram, confirm your MI, confirm your shock using cardiac power output and PAPI, right heart cath echo, all you need and initiate your uh, uh, therapy um, early. And they have improved compared to uh, historical trials, their survival, as Kasha mentioned, to 72%. And this has been replicated uh, at other centers around the country. I too get this question, ECMO versus Impella, uh, and it does depend, but I, it might not be the work, work question. It's not that one's gonna be better than the other, it's that they work synergistically. Shock is very variable, very heterogeneous. And so to do that, you need a lot of guns. And so you don't necessarily need, you know, so if you have lower stages of shock, like stage A and B, you're gonna do probably okay, at least to start with, with a balloon pump and uh, inotropes. But at the opposite of the spectrum, stage E shock, that's definitely territory for ECMO. And everything in between can be uh, <coughs> impella, tandem heart, if that's what you do in your institution but you need to be ready to escalate by reevaluating your patient frequently. And this is how we're gonna improve survival. So optimal timing by using your shock definitions is important, choosing your optimal support, but it might you even more important to improve survival. You have to have a strategy to prevent and manage potential device related complications, which Yale will be talking about here shortly. So yes, ECMO is the big gun, but and never bring a knife to a gunfight, make sure you time and recognize your shock early using your sky definitions. And ECMO is not the only gun. You have the right gun for the right type of shock. And of course, be careful how you shoot that gun, complication management. We don't wanna all be Dick Cheney's and we wanna make sure that we recognize all these complications and their management. And I'm gonna turn it over to um, Yale here because our goal of course is not to harm our patient, but to improve survival. Hello, everybody. Um, this is like the first time I haven't worn a mask in front of more than one person for a long time. So it's actually a pleasure. Um, let me just open up my slide here. I know. <laughs> okay, so um, I have the task of uh, talking about avoiding and managing complications of mechanical circulatory support. And see, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this particular subject. I just want to take a little time out to really congratulate um, 
uh, Dr. Reinowitz, Dr. Chavez, and Dr. Moody for putting on an outstanding ELSO conference uh, last month that was attended by 11,000 um, attendees. And the content was just fabulous. And I, I think um, uh, sometimes we see uh, people pass in the halls and we don't realize what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, I just want to really congratulate them for such an outstanding um, uh, presentations and uh, the, the fact that we could reach so many more people than we could um, live. That was actually a, a blessing in disguise. So uh, my task is a little bit about gun control. <laughs> Just because you have a gun doesn't mean everybody should have the gun. And uh, uh, it's obvious in this situation. And so, you know, the devices that we use um, are actually weapons um, that um, you would never imagine should go into the body. So I think, um, as you can see from this um, uh, Protect Dual, that uh, 31 caliber device that um, you have to be very careful with it. Um, actually, when I held this, it seemed kind of small, but when I tried to put it in, it seemed really big. So, <laughs> so I think uh, these are really lar rather large devices. So at the beginning of our experience, um, you know, as interventional cardiologists, we thought, well, let's just get this in as fast as we can because uh, these devices uh, need to be placed to save people's lives. Let's get the blood pressure up, get the flow up, and then give each other high fives and leave it all to Kasha. Um, of course, uh, we've uh, progressed in our uh, understanding of this process um, we still leave it to Kasha, of course, but at the end of the day, <laughs> and she'll, she'll tell, us, tell, us, tell that to us every time, but uh, I think we do know that the things that we do in the cath lab um, uh, at the beginning can really have an impact on their outcomes, and that if we take a little more time in taking care of these patients and looking at the specifics um, that they, we can save them a lot of trips up and down and, and really um, improve their overall outcome. Um, so I think the greatest tool that we have is really we have a great team here. And it consists of, you know, advanced heart failure, interventional cardiology, our staff in the labs in the operating room, perfusion, impella, uh, balloon pump team, our cardiac and vascular surgeons, you know, the development of an ECMO specialist nurse upstairs. So I think we have all these resources that we don't realize that we have. And even beyond that, um, as a patient recovers to optimize their um, long-term uh, um, you know, outcome. Um, I've always been hassled about the fact that I left the most important part of the member of our team out, which is the barista that uh, often keeps us uh, adequately caffeinated so that we can do our jobs at the highest level possible. Uh, so this, uh, this is a small study which really mag uh, exemplifies the, the problem that we're facing, which is uh, these patients are critically ill and their survival rate at the beginning um, is you know in the 50% range as Yvonne alluded to. Uh, but even with the smallest complications, uh, you know, vascular complications, their survival can diminish significantly. So um, so the things that we do can have a great impact on these very, very ill patients. And so these are the current devices that we use here at, uh, at, at uh, Abbott Northwestern uh, and probably around the city, um, balloon pump, you know, Yvonne talked about Impella CP, occasionally Impella 5.0, uh, VA ECMO, and then the Protect Dual uh, for a right ventricular assist device. And so these are the dimensions of the different devices, you know, the balloon pump, almost seems like an IV to us now because it's, uh, because it's only a French and it's standard for what we do for most interventions, you know. So, um, so the Impella predominantly is the 14 uh, French. Uh, the um, the, the 5.0 is 21 and it's typically implanted surgically. Uh, the ECMO, the arterial uh, uh, sheath is typically 19 or 17 French and the venous is 25. And the Protect Dual, we typically use a 31 French device in, in, in patients. And so what can go wrong? Well, essentially everything, and, and those of us in the cath lab uh, have seen it all. Um, you know, the patients are coming in, you know, you know, you know very sick and, uh, and, and that doesn't take very much. So uh, the, uh, the elements that are important are patient selection, managing the, uh, the potential vascular complications, looking at certain device-related complications and understanding the hemodynamics as well as uh, some of the neurological issues which may be delayed. So in terms of patient selection, uh, this is hot off the press from Dr. Berlacus' manual of PCI that was just sent out this, that was just um, published this year. And, uh, you know, he, he, he looks at uh, indications for support in high-risk PCI patients. And uh, just like what we, what we do with shock, we always look at the hemodynamics first to determine whether patients need support. Then it kind of delves into the, the lesion characteristics. Uh, and, and what devices may suit the patient the best. So uh, this is a very nice um, um, reference for uh, people who are actively involved in this area. So and he goes through every single step possible of how to put it in the device too. So it's a, it's a very rich resource. Um, so I think uh, for patients who need ECMO, we, you know, we have, a, we have a, um, the ECPR activation in our app. 
um, that really um, guides our, uh, our referring physicians as well as physicians in-house as to what patients uh, would qualify for uh, ECMO. And as, uh, as Kasha alluded to, there are um, algorithms and scoring systems that uh, uh, may be of some assistance. But unfortunately, when these patients come in, uh, if you can identify their gender and possibly their age, that may be all the information that you're going to get. So, um, uh, you know, despite these fairly simple looking uh, in, uh, exclusion and, uh, and inclusion criteria, even then we sometimes don't have <clears throat> uh, this information. And how many times have you heard, wow, this is a healthy 80 year old woman, you know, that, you know, <clears throat> or healthy 95 year old woman, you know, so, you know, our, we're, um, you know, this is as people I think at the Mayo Clinic would say a rich emotional experience and, and uh, we're, you know, we're designed as interventionalists to save people. So it's very hard for somebody to come into the cath lab and for us to say no immediately. And that's where a team approach is really useful because while we're doing things, uh, Kasha and Alex and those other folks that are looking through the data to determine uh, if this patient is appropriate. And, um, you know, sometimes you do have to say no and there are uh, appropriate criteria for that. And so the, 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 the complication I think we fear the most is really the vast on the vascular side for all the different devices that we talked about. And so um, these are complications that are very similar to everything that we do with angiography and device placement, except they're just magnified uh, in the sense that uh, we're using bigger devices and also the devices uh, are being used in patients who are very sick. Uh, so things like uh, you know, bleeding, retroperitoneal bleed, um, you know, limb ischemia uh, can sometimes be fatal. And even the, on the venous side, uh, there can be complications. We can do some you know, serious damage with a 31 French device uh, in the uh, right internal jugular vein, and we've all seen that before. So uh, these patients can't really <clears throat> tolerate much in the way of some of these complications. Um, Dr. Standoval, with uh, one of our fellows, uh, published a very nice paper outlining our access techniques here at, the, at the MHI, utilizing fluoroscopy, ultrasound guidance, uh, micropuncture access and angiography were indicated. Um, and we, of course, use graduated um, uh, escalation and wire support and stiffness. We don't just simply put a Lundquist wire in right away and, and deal with the complications. And we attempt these techniques even uh, when the patient's uh, undergoing Lucas resuscitation uh, because we think that's even more important in those particular patients. And so I think, you know, we have to have some bailout strategies uh, as interventionalists. Uh, you know, we have to understand that the patient's size, uh, underlying, uh, recognize the underlying possible peripheral arterial disease and the vascular limitations that we have. Uh, you know, fortunately, we have great working relationship with our vascular and cardiac surgeons. Every VA ECMO here comes with a vascular consultation. So uh, they're on board right away. And even in the cath lab, sometimes when we need them for cut downs. And, you know, we have to have a reasonable understanding of some endovascular rescue techniques, such as using large balloons, coils, cover stents, thrombectomy, and sometimes these devices can go places we don't want it to go, and we have to um, have some retrieval and snare techniques. Uh, we also have to consider alternative access, as you can see from the, um, from the picture of, on the right, that uh, sometimes you put in the venous cannula and you encounter these horrible aortoiliac vessels that uh, just cannot accommodate any type of device, and then uh, we have to call in our uh, cardiac or vascular surgeons for a, a subclavian approach. Um, and uh, what we found also is that we used to cramp everything on the same side, the venous, the arterial, and the anti-grade uh, catheters. And what we found is that if we split them up and did uh, contralateral cannulation, that our, um, that our um, complications rates were actually much less. And limb ischemia is obviously a, a big problem for, uh, can be a potentially a big problem for us. We put the patches on as soon as the patient get in the room. Um, and we try to, you know, in the past, we used to say, well, let's just send them upstairs and see how they do. That doesn't work very well because these are not patients that you want to transport anywhere. Uh, so we now we take the time to determine if the anti-grade perfusion catheter should be placed before the <coughs> patient leaves the cath lab. And so we have some very specific criteria that we look at to make that determination. And we put place the anti-grade catheter by uh, ultrasound guidance too, it's the same technique. Um, and obviously some people can have bilateral um, low tissue saturations, which are more systemic. I'll just talk very briefly about some of the balloon pump. Again, uh, we don't put in as many balloon pumps, but they can still be met with some complications. Uh, device can migrate uh, into the iliac vessels. Typically, it migrates more caudal than cephalad. Uh, it could be kinked. It can, there can be rupture of the device. Again, uh, we don't, you know, I think the device is relatively safe and we don't see many of those things, but it can certainly compromise the support of uh, some of those patients. So we have to recognize those potential complications. Uh, with the impella, um, 
uh, I guess the biggest problem that I've seen is uh, improper positioning where the catheter is perhaps in the mitral apparatus and can cause mitral regurgitation. And that can lead to um, sort of impediment in the, uh, the inflow to the device and cause hemolysis. Um, and it can cause hemolysis even at baseline and, and certainly being in the left ventricle, it can cause some arrhythmias. Uh, with the ECMO uh, circuit, um, you know, uh, fortunately, the, uh, the perfusionist has the device essentially ready to go by the time we, the patient arrives. And so uh, they prime and inspect the system. We uh, make sure that the patient is anticoagulated before uh, the cannulas are in place. And we back, back bleed the system to make sure there's no thrombus or air. And, you know, sometimes the cannulas can be uh, malpositioned and um, the people in the operating room don't have the luxury of uh, fluoroscopy all the time. And so sometimes they have to come to the cath lab to confirm the positioning. Uh, low flow is sometimes a, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big problem. And typically it's due to hypovolemia, but there are uh, other issues that can develop. And that's where uh, having a team approach where, um, you know, Kasha and the heart, advanced heart failure team is essentially in there with the patient the whole time that, that we're taking care of them. So uh, we have a, a pulmonary arterial catheter in place, an echo um, often and uh, to assess the contractility arterial line, and again, uh, the, the team uh, to, to help take care of the patients. And sometimes, you know, the catheters go where they, you don't want them to go, especially when you're doing it blindly at, at bedside, the venous cannula can sometimes go into the hepatic vein and become kinked. Uh, you'll probably see elements of that on uh, when you're looking at the flow, but, um, but there's something that we have to look out. And, and this has happened to me where I had to withdraw the, the cannula back down and reposition it. And then Ivana already touched on this, so I won't talk about it too much. Other than that, you know, when we, in the early in our experience, all we looked at was uh, what was the mean arterial pressure and is the patient oxygenating? And uh, we were satisfied with that. We know it does increase uh, mean arterial pressure. It may unload the, the right side somewhat, but it certainly places a, a huge afterload uh, um, burden on the left ventricle, uh, which may be reasonable if the uh, contractility is good, but if the patient has a non-contractile or minimally contractile left ventricle, um, it can lead to um, serious issues. As, uh, and, and it becomes a vicious cycle where the afterload um, you know, worsens the contractility. And, uh, and so uh, it could lead to you know, the, the thing that we dread the most, uh, which is uh, left ventricular uh, thrombosis. And we do have ways of, um, of venting the left ventricle. We don't use a balloon pump much anymore. We primarily go to, um, go to the Akpella model and of course, our surgeons are excellent and uh, can, can, uh, in, uh, can place a left ventricular vent very quickly and, and that's been successful in some of our patients. Uh, I know Yvonne said this is, a, 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 this is essentially a death sentence when people develop LV thrombosis, but I think Dr. Moody has uh, handled a few of these cases and, but it's not something that you, you wanna do on a, on a regular basis. And so something unusual about um, uh, ECMO is that sometimes you can see the Harlequin syndrome or the north-south watershed syndrome where you have differential oxygenation of the upper and lower um, parts of the body, uh, especially in uh, res combined respiratory and cardiac failure uh, where the, um, the, the uh, cardiac function is coming back before the, uh, the pulmonary function is that you can see that there's um, the deoxygenated blood being ejected from the left ventricle. Uh, competing with the, the, the oxygenated blood. Because, uh, you know, when I initially started doing ECMO, I always wonder, how does the blood get all the way up to the, the brain? And so it, it does, you know, but in this situation, it doesn't do so very well. And that's why we always place a right, uh, our, a right radio line to measure the oxygenation of these patients. And if that does happen, um, your options are to uh, convert to a VAV ECMO where you're, uh, uh, where you're placing some of the oxygenated blood back into the uh, the right side. If the patient is no longer requiring left ventricular support, you can convert to VV ECMO. Uh, if, if they have right ventricular failure, you can use a protect dual to support them. Um, I think the neurological complications are difficult to assess at the beginning uh, because the patients are always in, uh, obviously in shock and, and sometimes um, you know, difficult to assess. And, uh, but do we, we do monitor them very closely if there's any uh, signs or, or suggestion of trauma, their image very quickly because um, you know, we've, we've seen this uh, more, even more recently where a combination of thrombosis and, uh, and hem hemorrhage uh, can, be, uh, can be devastating for patients. They're well supported, but their neurological function is critical in the uh, recovery of these patients. And uh, we do have uh, neurology and neuropsychology involved in their care. So at the end of the day, you know, it's really... Um, the, the greatest tool is, um, is uh, planning um, and, uh, and having the full complement of people who can take care of these patients 
uh, not only in the cath lab, but also after they leave the cath lab. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you, Yale and Yvonne. That was absolutely outstanding. Um, I wanted to uh, just finish uh, with a case, a real case uh, that we all actually took care of um, that uh, kind of closed the circle of uh, mechanical support, uh, both temporary and um, uh, durable. So it is a 56-year-old gentleman with uh, known and stage on ischemic cardiomyopathy. He was referred to us from uh, out of state for ev evaluation for advanced heart failure therapies. Um, he was optimized in the um, uh, ICU with nipride, didn't require uh, inotropic support. We actually wanted to proceed with LVAD implantation, but uh, he wanted to go back home to take care of his affairs. Uh, as you can see, this is his echo. He has a very large left ventricle. Uh, some um, mitral regurgitation. Right ventricle is uh, relatively normal in size, but it appears uh, probably moderately um, hypokinetic. Um, so even uh, before all this started, we're kind of wondering whether he might benefit from a simultaneous uh, RVAD implantation at the time of LVAD. So at that time, obviously, he's at risk. Uh, he's stage A, but doing relatively well, and uh, we send him home. He was readmitted uh, after a few days, much earlier than uh, he was supposed to, with worsening shortness of breath, dizziness, hypotension. His MAP was like around 60. His creatinine was up from 1.8 to 2.3, and he had mildly elevated lactate, LFTs. As you can see, uh, his hemodynamics showed um, a quite severely elevated uh, filling pressures and borderline cardiac output, and his cardiac power output was um, borderline normal. Uh, at that time, because of um, end organ dysfunction, we started him on dobutamine, and he quickly uh, reconstituted. So at that time, um, he was uh, more of a stage B slash C. Um, and we started to discuss whether we should proceed with um, leventricular assist device placement at that time, but we were a little greedy, and we wanted his end organs to get a little better to, to his baseline. And again, he went into this hemodynamic roller coaster, feeling better, feeling worse, Again, the next day, MAPs are lower. Uh, cardiac index is uh, also below two, despite escalating doses of inotropes and lactate continues to slowly rise. It wasn't that he ever had it like at five, but it was just one eight, two, 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 eight. Cardiac power output is uh, decreasing. Um, so obviously he's now in stage C. Um, and again, team discussion. Uh, but we decided to actually uh, move forward with the intraortic balloon uh, uh, pump placement. Uh, there is quite a bit of data demonstrating that uh, patients who have intraortic balloon placed before LVAD implantation have better outcomes. And we kind of thought he was still sort of borderline and thought that might be enough. And again, mild improvement, uh, but uh, it wasn't uh, really lasting. Um, the next day, the next morning, he became more tachycardic, borderline hypotensive, lactates really trending up. Uh, and then at that time, he's already on uh, two inotropes. His, um, he's that being diuresed, but not really making that much urine and creatinine is worsening. His cardiac power output is really low now, 0.4. And he's showing uh, signs of biventricular failure. Uh, his RA never really decreased below 15. Poppy is 1.4. And he's still awake and maintaining well, but you can tell he's struggling. So at that time, um, uh, the options were, let's just proceed with LVAD implantation with a planned RVAD, uh, or should we optimize them hemodynamically uh, more before doing it? Uh, so clearly, despite our um, uh, 
uh, different therapies, mechanical circulatory support with a balloon pump, so not very powerful, but also multiple inotropes and pressors, he's still uh, deteriorating. Um, and uh, at that time, we decided to proceed with AWAKE, the ECMO implantation in the cath lab um, as a bridge to durable leverage gases device. Uh, we have done it on probably now about eight patients with good success. Those patients um, didn't need to be intubated um, and either as bridge to recovery, um, peri high risk PCI, or I believe four patients before LVAD implantation. So he did undergo uh, um, RVAD and LVAD and ultimately did well. I have to say that I just wanted to quote that one uh, study that we're not crazy that we're putting ECMO in uh, awake people. But a few years ago, there was a publication from Yale um, that demonstrated improved outcomes in patients who had uh, VA ECMO, awake VA ECMO placed before LVAD. ECMO support was very short, only 2.7 days. And that way they were able actually to <clears throat> achieve outcomes for Intramax uh, one patients comparable to Intramax two patients. So just in summary, um, again, this is I think for the third time, we're just reinforcing the, uh, the new uh, stages of cardiogenic shock. Stage A, be aware, stage two, um, volume inotropes. Oftentimes these patients actually can uh, reconstitute with uh, nipride as well if they're not hypotensive. Uh, stage C, classic shock. Uh, you, can con you should start thinking about mechanical circulatory support. And then stage D, uh, definitely uh, not responding just to medical therapy. And stage E, these are the extremists, oftentimes um, in cardiac arrest. And uh, in those patients, you should really think whether they're candidates for eCPR. Um, thank you. And um, I also really wanted to um, give a big shout out to our uh, to Yale and Yvonne. They really created this um, ECMO program in the cath lab <clears throat> together with all the other interventionalists. I feel you guys don't get enough credit for the ECMO program. Um, I call you guys sprinters. We are kind of marathon runners. We basically sit up at night and you know, take care of these patients, but you sprint oftentimes several times during the night. I have to say we've been tracking um, timing for uh, our interventionist average timing from stick, we call it from stick to flow. It's about nine minutes, which is incredible. We didn't have a limb amputation since 2016. And I wanna give a shout out to all the vascular surgeons, but uh, predominantly Dr. Titus, who really together with our interventional cardiologists, um, created this uh, special limb protocol that's been really working well. So um, thank you and thank you for your attention. I know if anybody has any questions. We can start with an online question. And that question is, uh, Navin Kapoor recently published in Jack Heart Failure that complete hemodynamic profiling with PACs in CS is associated with lower in-hospital mortality. Uh, the question is, are you using hemodynamics to determine which device to use? And I think that can be a group discussion. Maybe I'm gonna start. Um, <clears throat> so we do use hemodynamics. Um, so we, um, we, and I have to say before all this data um, uh, and uh, stages of shock uh, kind of, uh, became publicly known and published. Uh, we've been using hemodynamics for the last 10 years that I've been here. Um, I don't think, uh, uh, I would say, um, I don't know, we would say Yvonne or Yale, whether we decide, I think it's more of a complex issue. So we look at the hemodynamics, but we also look at the patient. We also look at whether it's biventricular failure or whether it's uh, just isol isolated LV failure. So I think it's more just of kind of a, a complex approach. I wouldn't say that just hemodynamics would sway me one way to another. They might if the patient is in cardiac arrest or if let's say cardiac output is extremely low and patient is very hypotensive. Uh, but I feel there is this gray zone when uh, we can just be like, well, let's just try meds. Uh, let's put a balloon pump and see how the patient does. I would say in an acute setting, we rarely hear at this institution put an impella in. Uh, maybe we should more often. We get transfers uh, on Impella. And unfortunately, in those patients, in the majority of cases, we have to upgrade it to ECMO because they're that sick. So I don't know if it answered the questions. Um, what would you say? Oh. You can actually speak to 
audience might know. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's correct. I think in the cat lab, I mean, I think first of all, we can all we can always do better. Uh, and I think one of the lessons of the um, work that's been done by Bill O'Neill is that uh, recognizing shock early and maybe mobilizing, you know, before you get to the cath lab, because we're very quick in the cath lab, <coughs> and recognizing that shock and then in the cath lab, you know, to make better use of right heart cath and PAPI and the cardiac power output uh, could help us tailor our devices. I have to say that, you know, we are a very big ECMO center because we get that sick of patients, but there is a population of patients out there that probably could be better, better tailored uh, with the use of Intella and maybe even avoid escalation. Uh, it remains to be seen. Certainly the work done in some of these registries uh, are reporting uh, outcomes of survival, which are pretty impressive at 72%. And the one that I showed, or at least over 70%, I think the group at ANOVA has similar taking their survival using these systems of care and protocols from less than 50% in 2016 to over 70% in 2018 within two years. So I think we can do a better job at that. I, I know in the cath lab, a lot of times we'll get that R reopen and uh, there you go. And then two hours later, the back it almost in stage D shock and we have to put the ECMO in. Well, what if I just thought and stopped a little bit and did a right heart cath and place it in the hella? I think we, we have, uh, so we, we certainly can do it and we can do a better job at that. I think it's important because we do want to improve the survival of shock. And I think like calculating, uh, you know, poppy and cardiac power output, I, I don't think we do it routinely. Um, sometimes do it after, oh, you know, I told you or I thought so. So I think just being a little bit more systematic, I agree with you. I just think in anybody who is in stage A, we should put a, you know, PA catheter in and then take it from there. So I think it's a brilliant talk uh, by all three of you. So a couple of questions is, I see that uh, generally the transition has been from Intella to ECMO. Has there been a reverse transition because of you know, vascular complications or immobility? Because ECMO, as you said, rightly, very intense to manage. So are we looking at a reverse protocol where use ECMO to stabilize, reassess all the parameters, and then go to a yes. So, um, so unfortunately, you know, uh, in terms of uh, complications of impella, long-term complications, even though the possibly the vascular complications are less, as I mentioned, we really uh, have been very blessed with that protocol and having vascular surgery on every case that we really haven't had any major complications, uh, vascular complications in those patients. The one that is just a nightmare is um, uh, basically hemolysis leading to active renal failure with impella. Um, and, you know, uh, our team always, we're always discuss how do we do it wrong? You know, how does it work in other places? But to the point where we, you know, have to take out the impella because of our acute, acute renal failure. We had a few cases where they came on impella, we added ECMO, and then the weaning process was, you know, weaning ECMO, leaving the impella. Uh, I don't remember when we ever left an impella in and took out the ECMO, but obviously we looking first whether they can take out the ECMO. So um, just maybe because they're sicker, I don't know, maybe they're larger. Uh, it's just, you know, migrates all the time. And I still remember a couple of patients that we've added on CRT because of the horrible, you know, pigment nephropathy. Uh, but I think it, it's a great thought. I kind of hope that maybe at some point we will be doing now, especially with the new 5.5, we can do more, you know, surgical, more controlled, and then, you know, have them mobilized, you know, and, you know, all that stuff, and then maybe give them more time for recovery. Obviously, the ECMO, you can't really ambulate, you know, you can't do any of this. So I think that's a good thought. We just haven't been very successful, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the thing, just to comment, means with Harlequin syndrome, it was interesting that uh, we have also seen patients with spinal ischemia as well because of the mixing cloud. Uh, which is very unusual and a uh, complication of uh, spinal artery uh, thrombosis. But uh, so, great yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we do, you know, we now actually uh, do a pre and post oxy gases, and that is something that you know theoretically you just you know assuring you know that you infusing at least a gas with you know those you know acidotic blood and stuff. But yeah, that's a pretty dreadful complication. We haven't had it so far, so. Mm -hmm. And my last question, <laughs> sorry, I'm asking too many questions. <laughs> but I think with, uh, you know, we are doing more interventions now in different space and we've got all the expertise of you know, stabilizing patient doing transitional functions, you know, you can get time. 
do you think the acute need for surgical involvement in terms of putting an LV vent, for example, uh, is really needed acutely because you could do it through transeptal approach maybe uh, if we have better tools or is other manufacturers <coughs> looking at that versus? So, so in terms of transeptal, um, we initially, like several years ago, we tried that approach. Uh, not of all of our interventionists uh, actually are able to do it. We had two bad outcomes. That was probably like eight years ago. So then we shifted to fully towards uh, surgical venting. You know, and it's not that you need it like emergently. It's more urgent. You know, we usually um, have all of our patients on inotropes. So we want to promote LV ejection. We want to promote that, you know, aortic valve uh, to open. We have a protocol where we uh, aim for pulse pressure at least 20 and we're happy with 10. And obviously we do a, a echo usually in the cath lab and if not, we do it upstairs. Uh, we had like, um, prop, I don't know, several um, LV, surgically placed LV vents within like six you know, hours from placement. Uh, we only had like one bad outcome, but we had like, I don't know, 20 or something. But now we move towards um, Impella. Sometimes the interventionists will tell us I, there's no way I can fit anything else in, you know, but I don't think we've had, we, I think we had maybe one last year. So we definitely shifted more to the Acapella model. Uh, I think it's always good to have, you know, surgical backup, but I don't think it's emergent. I think it's more urgent. And we try with, you know, inotropes and, you know. And she also, atrial septostomy, uh, when you're successful, it can be very hard to regulate the vent. Yes. In fact, you can't regulate it, and you can actually make a tubular hole and into the ventricle. It's no longer ejecting. With surgical vents, you can have a, a clamp yeah. on your tubing, yeah. uh, and then with Impella, you can change the p-value uh, and regulate the vent. So uh, it's so it, it's, it's quicker, you know, than right. transept. But admittedly, we don't have the transept punctures as, as much as some of our colleagues in the uh, structurally. The, the other thing is about the, you know, the LV vent, which we usually, majority of patients actually had LV vent, either died or they actually progress into durable LVAD. So when you have that, it's actually a really nice way to load the right ventricle and kind of, you know, see whether the patient will need RV support and how they're going to do with an LVAD. But obviously it's kind of a byproduct of it, but. You are you definitely swung some boards, I think, by showing Dick Cheney. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that's like before election the election. Day, yeah. So, yeah, I was also <laughs> dating myself. I don't know, a lot of young people in the audience. I'm sure, so, uh, I, I just thought it was a, uh, fortunately he did okay. He didn't get hurt. Thank you. Have there been economic analyses of these different approaches? Some of the disposables and some <clears throat> techniques are uh, much more expensive uh, than others. Yeah, so we, I mean, it's a no, that's another, that's a great question. So, um, you know, ECMO is cheap, Impella is uh, expensive, right? So I think the disposables for ECMO is probably 10 grand maybe, or uh, now with cardio help, when we used to uh, use uh, cheaper um, uh, pumps like uh, Rotoflow, it was like two, three grand. Uh, Impella, I believe, is 30,000. Um, so, Definitely, you know, much. But I think also that, but the other, but on the flip side, ECMO reimburses a lot. So I think Mark Ebling looks at those and I think it'll be interesting to look, but just like uh, comparing costs, obviously Impella is much more three times or four times it's more expensive than ECMO. Just, you know, so then you're adding it for venting. But then the question is with the OR, right? I mean, um, you're bringing the team and that would be for me very hard to, I know the cannula is like $300, but what about the, the whole rest, anesthesia, you know, tying the team. So, and it's not that many. I mean, it's not that we're venting everybody. I would say venting is probably, I don't know, maybe 15%. So let's say last year we did 100 ECMOs with 15 patients. So, but, and it's better for the patient, I feel, less invasive. So. Thank you so much.